Hi, it's Dwyer. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. It is May the 30th, 2024. Let's talk about one of the better put together cards I've seen. It's this five on five card that's coming up. I think a lot of these fights are competitively matched. Let's talk about them. But first, remember the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, I'm not going to give winners and losers. This is really a video where we talk about styles. Uh, I might do some further videos for uh, premium subscribers. Now, Zhili Zhang is the quickest starter in today's heavyweight division. Right? In my opinion, he is a risk taker. He takes chances throwing power shots before an opponent has figured out the angles. In fact, I believe that's his game. He comes in firing. Right? He is extremely coordinated. He is extremely two-handed. Deontay Wilder is not. Right? Wilder looks to me to be very right-hand centric. Now, don't get me wrong. Zhili Zhang isn't a great athlete, right? And he does get tired later in fights. But let me point out his uh, two losses, Ergovic and Parker. I would say those are two of the few guys in the heavyweight division who would be able to compete with him and beat him on their athleticism. Right? Let's be clear here, too. He knocks down both of them. Right? So Zhili Zhang, to me, is really a victim in part of the matchmaking. I think Zhili Zhang would give Tyson Fury a very difficult time. Let's remember, Fury, of course, has been down in a number of fights including the last fight against Usyk, right? Understand, too, um, while I do believe Usyk is one of those hyper-athletic guys who would give Zhang problems, especially in the later rounds, and keep in mind, too, Usyk is a southpaw, like Zhang. You know, it's very important to look at guys like this, and understand that they're really big-time threats to the throne. His margin of loss to Ergovic and to Parker really wasn't that great. Right? Understand, this guy in his 40s is in the right division because heavyweights age more slowly. We really don't know how old Sonny Liston was. We do know George Foreman was in his mid-40s when he won the heavyweight title. Right? Heavyweights age more slowly than everyone else. Zhang has a skill set that makes him still competitive in his 40s. Let me point out, too, that unlike Wilder, Zhang can throw power shots wherever he is in the ring. Right? Wilder needs a little bit of space. Wilder needs to have that right hand ready. Being two-handed allows Zhili Zhang to throw punches whatever angle you come at him from. Now the key for me in this fight against Deontay Wilder, something to look for is Zhang's right hand, his non-dominant hand. To Wilder's body. Understand in that Joe Joyce fight and the rematch, he stops Joe. He drops Joe with the right hand up top. But understand before he throws that right hand up top during the fight, he lands several crushing right hands to Joe's body. Right? In other words, this is a guy who can land that right hand. Now it's important in this fight because Wilder is lean and will weigh less than Zhang. 
right? Jang, of course, has a lot of fat around his midsection. Let me just point out that Wilder went down in the second Fury fight off a body shot. As I've pointed out in other videos, Wilder in some of his recent fights, including his fight against Hellenius, was fighting at a weight that today we would call a bridger weight. Right? He would have qualified to fight as a bridger weight in that fight. So Wilder is tall, but he's slender. I believe there's an open question on how many body shots he can take. He's very right hand specific. He likes to knock you down by hitting you with his right hand to your head. I understand there is a Bermain's Deverne rematch where he hurts Deverne off a left hook up top. That's rare. Right? That's rare. Wilder is a headhunter with his right hand. That's what Jang has to worry about. Let me just say, Wilder does have more ring coverage than Zhang. Zhang's straight left is shorter than Wilder's straight right, which Wilder can throw, arguably, from the lip of the pocket. The big question in this fight, for me, is will Wilder be able to avoid Zhang's left and land a longer right hand from the outskirts of the pocket where only he can land shots. In other words, Wilder has to be careful here. He has to make sure he has proper distance between himself and Zhang. Understand, he was reckless against Hellenius. He's in the corner against the guy who knew him, who was his sparring partner. Hellenius follows Wilder over to the corner. Wilder then hits him with an excellent short right hand that ends the fight. But understand, Hellenius had Wilder where he wanted him, in the corner. Wilder cannot make those kinds of mistakes against Zhili Zhang. Let's shift gears and talk about Hamza Shiraz, really Muhammad Shiraz. There was some marketing going on with Team Shiraz and Ammo Williams, right? Now, Williams is all about two-handed volume. The reason for his nickname is he's like a machine gun. He wants to trade. He wants, he wants to land hooks, power punches with both hands. But... He's facing one of the best jabs in boxing. Shiraz is a lot like Thomas Hearns. He's also a lot like another Hall of Famer who is still in the public light, Oscar De La Hoya, whose lead left hand, he used to throw a punch we called a 45 back in the day, was his dominant hand. So Oscar... Fighting out of an orthodox stance was actually bludgeoning you up front with his dominant hand as his jab hand. That's the secret to Hamza Shiraz. Let me point out too that Shiraz is interesting because Thomas Hearns, of course, at times danced when he had to. Right? That first Ray Leonard fight, that's Tommy Hearns moving away from the pocket. By the way, he's winning the fight on the judges' scorecards when he gets stopped. Right? By contrast, Shiraz likes to be the aggressor. This is a guy who's on his front foot, who's trying to tilt you onto his, your back foot. Let me say, too, that Shiraz's straight right, which is not his dominant hand, is actually a pretty good punch. So Shiraz, to me, has the total package. The question for me at middleweight, in fact, there are a couple of questions, is what happens if Shiraz fights Janabek? Right, folks, that's a great fight. 
Also, there's another question. Because Shiraz is so front foot heavy, because Shiraz isn't a guy who gets up on his toes and can dance on his back foot, what happens if he fights a KG vet? At middleweight, that would be Chris Eubank. Right? I think that's an interesting fight. Right? Here, there's a big question. Now, I want you to think about Ray Leonard against the hitman, Thomas Hearns. Right? Leonard, blistering hand speed, combination puncher, over a 60% KO ratio. But Leonard, whether it's Hagler, whether it's Hearns as an opponent, Leonard would jump around the ring. He would stay outside. Then he would pick an entry point. If he saw an opening, that's when he would dive into the water. Right? So Leonard could jump in on Thomas Hearns, get by that brutal Hearns jab, the one Duran never gets by. Right? Leonard was able to jump in suddenly, get by the jab, then let his hands go. The big question in this Shiraz Williams fight for me, and I'm just sharing my notes, you have your notes, we have a comment section. I hope you feel free to share parts of your notes in the comment section of this video. For me, the big question is, will Williams be able to pick his entry point to get by Shiraz's jab to land his combinations? Let's be clear on the type of jab Shiraz has. Folks, this is Larry Holmes' level. Right? Holmes... Granted, mobile jab, but understand, if you don't get by Shiraz's jab, you're not beating him, right? Just straight up, right? You're simply not beating him. Ammo Williams is going to have to get by that jab, right? He would have to have some Deontay Wilder ability to throw a major punch, right? Wilder's straight right from outside the pocket to be competitive if he can't figure out a way to dodge the jab and get inside. For a fight where a fighter finishes off Thomas Hearns by getting by the jab with hooks, I encourage people to look at the rematch of Hearns against Aran Barkley, who beat him twice. Right? You really have to figure out how to get by a great jab in order to be effective. Let's shift gears. Let's talk about another fight. You know, Daniel Dubois is a blessed puncher with both hands. But boxing has a mental side. And Dubois is tentative. Right? If an opponent moves and hits him with a jab, Dubois, in my opinion, and we're expressing a lot of hard thoughts in this video, and I understand that. If Dubois gets hit with jabs, he gets discouraged. His punch resistance is an open question. A cruiserweight, Kevin Lorena, and granted, Lorena hits hard. I'm not here to say Lorena doesn't hit hard. But Lorena went to the UK, is fighting Dubois, who really should be more of a Mike Tyson type figure. In other words, Dubois should be in showing you his punching power and hand speed early. Right, you should be the opponent thinking, oh my goodness, this guy's two-handed and I didn't, wave, I didn't like the way that last punch felt. Right? You should be the one getting discouraged. You should be the one getting knocked down early. Right? Instead, Lorena, a cruiserweight, knocks down... <laughs> I'm sorry. That was rude. I didn't mean to laugh. He knocks down Daniel Dubois multiple times in Dubois' backyard. Right? There are many heavyweights who view Usyk as a dangerous cruiser who's invading the division. With Dubois, you have to ask the question, 
which dangerous cruiser? Right, Lorena comes this close to beating Dubois. But make no mistake, Power is the great equalizer. Dubois in a fight that he's getting beaten up in. Gets Lorena over by the ropes and ends the show. Folks, I don't know what else to say. Dubois was that close to losing that fight. And what's discouraging is just the fact that Dubois didn't enter the ring with the idea that he's fighting a smaller man. And he is a big puncher at home. Right? Dubois is that rare fighter who might not know who he is. Right? You, the fan, are watching him and you say, wow, this guy has fast hands. And you say, wow, this guy hits hard. Right? The question is whether the guy himself understands that. Now, let me say this. Philippe Ergovic. You know, I call him the heir apparent. Even now, after watching Usyk beat Fury in a very competitive match, there's an open question in my mind on whether anyone in the heavyweight division can beat Philippe Ergovic. Now, Ergovic doesn't dance, but in my opinion, he gallops. In other words, a Larry Holmes could get up on his toes, a Tony Tucker, we're talking about the 80s, early 90s, could get up on his toes and they could literally dance, right? They would be circling you. You want to see a good fight where Larry Holmes had to dance. That Ernie Shavers rematch Larry gets dropped by Ernie Shavers, right? Ernie's not confused. He knows he needs a knockout. Larry gets on his toes. He's semi-conscious, and he dances around Ernie Shavers. Now, dancing is out of favor in the heavyweight division. Let me point out that one of the reasons why the Bridgerweight division is so important is you might end up with different fight styles based on the divisions. In other words, lighter heavyweights might come up with techniques to survive that bigger, clunkier 250, 260 pound heavyweights might not even consider. Right, today's heavyweight division is about guys trying to close the show early, isn't it? Right, understand if you weigh 220, your thought process might be different. Your thought process might be, hey, I've got to make this guy miss. You know, I've got to last a few rounds. I've got to take this into the later rounds. I've got to keep this guy turning. I've got to flash hand speed. I've got to impress the judges. In a sport called boxing, I actually have to box. Right now, understand, Philippe Ergovic, in this era, moves better than most heavyweights. Right? He, um, you know, it's not like he's Larry Holmes. He's not up on his toes dancing and stuff. This is a Rocky Three where Apollo Creed is showing Rocky how to get up on his toes, right? He doesn't move that way. What he does is you notice that Jili Zhang comes forward. Zhang is about to give Ergovic his first loss. And you notice Ergovic has a rhythm to him and can move away, right? He's not running. It's lateral movement, right? What I want people to understand here is that Ergovic is what I call an advanced fighter. He can loop his punches. I want you to think about Terence Crawford. I want you to think about Arthur Perturbiev, right? Arthur Perturbiev against Anthony Yard in the United Kingdom. 
right? You'll notice Baturbiev seems to be coming in at weird angles, doesn't he? Baturbiev, Joe Smith, in the New York City area. Baturbiev comes in at weird angles and he's throwing these punches and they're landing. Then you realize that Baturbiev can tailor his shots based on the situation. Right, so Anthony Yard must have been wondering what was going on because Yard wants an opponent in front of him. Here is Baturbiev off at the side. Now granted, Baturbiev's a little reckless. He'll hit you in the back of the head. But Baturbiev's off at the side. And he's able to loop shots. So you can't think, okay, I've seen his left hook. I know the angles. The loopers deprive you of that ability. Now, Ergovic is one of boxing's premier loopers. It's extremely hard to block his shots. There's an optical illusion, too, where Ergovic's fighting a guy his height, and it looks like he's throwing punches from up high down on the guy. So let's just say between these two fighters... Unlike Dubois, Ergovic knows who he is. Ergovic knows when to move. He doesn't need a corner to tell him. Right? Ergovic knows when things are desperate, and they were in the closing rounds of that Zhili Zhang fight. He had to dig deep there. Right? Had a cut scalp that was dripping blood into his face. Uh, had been knocked down in the fight. For me, the big question here is whether Dubois, who is not as complicated as Ergovic, right? Dubois' punches are what they are. It's not like Dubois is looping shots, right? The question here is whether Dubois will be able to figure out Ergovic's timing, which is unusual, right? Jili Zhang did. Can Dubois. Let's continue. Nick Ball is a short dynamo. Folks, look closely at him. I don't care what height he is. This guy is one of the best athletes in the sport. You heard me talk about some other athletes, right? Joe Parker. Uh, Philippe Ergovic. Uh, Usyk is a great athlete, right? These are the guys who, as the fight goes along, you notice a Tyson Fury starts to look uncoordinated versus an Alexander Usyk in the later rounds, right? Usyk seems to be moving more crisply. The hand speed gap becomes bigger, right? You realize that if you stopped the fight and told these guys to do a decathlon, Fury would get smoked, right? Well, just understand, Nick Ball, in my opinion, is one of the best athletes in the sport. Let me say this too, and it's striking. Nick Ball has a left hand that has ridiculous ring coverage on it. In other words, you see Nick Ball... He's shorter. You see his opponent. The opponent looks like he's a few feet away from Ball. Then Ball starts to throw this left hand. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it gets there. Right? He has ring coverage. He can cover a lot of distance with that left hand. Let me say this too. He's aggressive and he's a combination puncher, right? This is a guy who doesn't feel lucky to hit you with one good shot. No, this is the guy who thinks he's alpha. So Nick Ball will jump in the pocket and folks, he lets his hands go. Understand too, you know, for most guys, they see a good counter, they'll land a counter punch. Combination punchers think differently than the rest of us. Right? Think Andy Ruiz at heavyweight. Combination punchers will counter you 
with a combination. In other words, Nick Ball comes in and he lands that first shot. And you say, oh, Nick got a good counter. Then you realize Nick's still deep in the pocket. That first shot is just one of many. Right, this is the shorter man in the ring who is the big man on campus. Now let me say, Ray Ford is a slick combination puncher himself, and he's also a southpaw. He's unbeaten, but he likes structure, right? He has the same problem that opponents of Fabio Wardley have, right? Nick Ball is expecting, excuse me, not Nick Ball, Ray Ford is expecting a traditional fight where he has the hand speed advantage, he's coming forward, he's trying to counter you with single shots even though he's a combination puncher. If it's a clear day he'll throw a combination but he's not the risk taker. Nick Ball is. He's more of a traditional fighter. The big question for me is whether Ford can keep Ball outside. If Ball gets inside and is able to tilt Ford onto his back foot, and if Ball starts landing his long left, this fight could be the fight of the night. Finally, let's talk about Craig Richards versus Willie Hutchinson. Now, Richards, let me just say this. The flaws make the diamond. And by that I mean, you see a guy with some part of his game that looks strange. Something just doesn't look proper. In Craig Richards' case, it's this awkward looking but extremely dangerous right hook up top right folks he throws it high you wonder how he gets leverage on it right this is like being a baseball player and looking at a pitcher with a weird wind up and then of course the pitch comes in at 97 miles an hour and you're asking yourself well how how did the guy get leverage on this right Craig Richards has an A level very awkward looking high right hook right let me say this too his right hand is heavy in general in other words this is a tall skinny guy who has a lot of power in that right right so he'll throw an uppercut with that same right hand the one that he throws a too high right hook with right He'll throw an uppercut, and you notice that uppercut hits hard. That uppercut can stop guys. So Craig Richards is that guy who, quite frankly, when you see him, to judge him, you have to look at his opponent. So you see him throw a high right, and you say, wow, that looked awkward. Then you notice the opponent is in trouble. You think to yourself, okay, well, well, that's effective. You see him suddenly reach down. This is a tall guy. Reach down in the pocket and throw an uppercut. And you're thinking, wow, that's high risk. His head's right over the pocket. Then you notice the guy he hits is struggling. Let's talk about his opponent here, Willie Hutchinson. Believe it or not, Willie Hutchinson is more complicated than Craig Richards. Right, Hutchinson can loop his punches. Right, the things I said about Philippe Bergevic apply to this guy. Right, he's the guy who you're looking at him and he's throwing that right hand with a loop. Then you notice that he can throw it straight, extremely straight. Right, you understand that this is the guy who you're not going to see all the angles of his punches for several rounds, right? Let me also point out too, 
that this guy's even trickier than that. Right? As I said, he's complicated. You see his hand speed and you say, okay, this guy has decent hand speed. But then you notice that when there's an opening, when he thinks he's close to a knockdown, you see something that you don't see that often in boxing. This guy lets his hands go and suddenly the hand speed is a lot faster. This guy has elite hand speed. You don't know it based on his normal speed. In other words, this is the guy fighting with a reserve. Right? The guy is that much better than his competition. Where he can come out and pace himself and pace his hand speed. He saves his top level stuff for certain situations. In my opinion... Hutchinson is better than advertised. Let me say this too. You know, I made a video a few days ago where I was praising Jack Catterall for throwing a jab from his waist. Kind of like Larry Holmes did. Right? Understand Hutchinson throws his jab from his waist. Right? This is the guy who is the ringer. The big question here for me is can Hutchinson avoid Richards' awkward-looking high right hook and deceptive right uppercut? Again, the flaws make the diamond. If this fight starts and Hutchinson looks like he hasn't done his homework and starts to get hit with that high, awkward-looking right hook, he's going to be in trouble. But if Hutchinson is one of these guys who enters the ring, whatever the guy says, right? You know, boxers love to say, I just fight who they tell me to fight. I don't know much about my opponent, right? If Hutchinson enters the ring and you notice early that he's prepared for that high right hook, especially since he has the superior hand speed and he's hiding it, then we'll be in for a treat. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. I hope you leave them in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.